Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to East Central Missouri and the world, and welcome to the James Strong Show podcast, podcast number 305. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. I appreciate it. This podcast was recorded on the morning of Saturday, March the 25th from the James Strong Studio in Western St. Charles County. It's been a little bit, but uh, we have back as guest on the show, Jerome Konigsfeld. And he's, for those of you who don't know, he's an adventurer. He's been around the world, uh, interesting places at interesting times. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jerome. Good morning, James. How are you? I'm outstanding. How about you? You're good too, I assume. Yes, sir. Very, Very good. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Jerome, tell, tell, tell us the listeners just a little bit about uh, what you did, when you did it, why you did it, and a, just a synopsis as to where you went over a number of years a long time ago. Well, back in uh, 1968, I was going to go backpack hitchhike Europe for six months, and I ended up uh, five years, made a trip around the earth. Uh, 40-some countries, and uh, uh, just uh, had a good time and enjoyed myself and uh, uh, learned a lot of things. And uh, just just so folks don't get the wrong idea as to what you did, uh, you generally didn't stay in Hilton hotels while you were traveling, correct? Oh, no. I stayed in, in five-cent-a-night hotels and ten-cent-a-night hotels. Yeah. Even and, and, that's, in, now that's, and that's not just a, a hyperbole. You really did pay five or 10 cents a night to stay in these places. Yes, I did. So e- you, even Europe, all, all of Europe, except for Scandinavia, I, I paid a quarter, except in Scandinavia, it was a dollar. So you, you live like the common folk. <laughs> yeah. And ate, ate uh, the least expensive food with the, with the uh, lesser people had, and that, but it was food and, uh, uh, I didn't, uh, have, uh, no luxuries. So let's put it that way. But you were able to do a lot of things over a long period of time, sometimes with people, sometimes on your own. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of hitchhiking, a lot of walking and steam locomotive trains and, uh, buses and trucks and whichever way I could get there, the cheapest possible way. Well, today on, on your adventure, we had talked about uh, discussing your, uh, your adventures in the country of Laos in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think you said it was the early seventies. You were there, correct? That's right. Uh, 1971. And, and I asked the question, I said, well, let's see, there were a lot of Mar- Americans in Laos in 1971, but they weren't hitchhiking for fun. Wasn't there a war going on at that time? Yes, there was. And, and that, that's, what's really crazy because, uh, when I, when I crossed uh, the Mekong from uh, Thailand into Laos, Vientiane was the capital. And at the time, in Southeast Asia, in the Far East, which I'd already been, which I'd already been, uh, Time and Newsweek magazines were everywhere. This was the 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 East, the Asian, the East, uh, Southeast Asia, or uh, Far East edition of Time and Newsweek, and. I used to read them because they, they were everywhere, well, more or less everywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I had seen the pictures of Nixon on TV saying that we had no American troops in Laos and Cambodia. At the time, they were just, he was supposedly telling they were just in Vietnam. Right. Well, as soon as you walked into the city of Vientiane, there were all the American soldiers in their uniforms <laughs> and with their weapons everywhere. I mean, a bunch of them. So what you're saying is the government lied to us. Exactly. I mean, shocking, I, shocking. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> big time. Um, well, now, uh, again, this was in the, 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 the early seventies. Was there, was there still the old, I mean, that was old French Indochina. Was there still the French influence at all in that part of the world or had that more or less uh, waned away? No, they had, they had all been thrown out or left, whatever the case may be, but because it was a French colony or a French protectorate, whatever you want to call it, you had the French architecture there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and you've seen, you've seen a lot of that, uh, uh, 
you know what's really crazy? I can't tell you one thing I ate while I was in Vietnam. That I don't know where I ate or what I ate. I'm sure there was lots of French food, but I don't know what I ate. And, uh-huh. and it must not have been very important because I cannot remember a thing about it. Uh, the, the, anyhow, but one thing, another thing that you did see of the war, the CIA was there. Really? Now, how, did, had, now how, did, how did you know it was the CIA? Because everybody would point and say that's what it was. It was like a, I'm going to say a five-story building. It might have been a five or a seven-story building. But it had the window tint like gold or yellow window tint on all the windows, on every window in the building. It stuck out like a sore thumb. I, you would think the CIA would try to hide themselves. Uh-huh. And all their black limousines either had that same window tint on their, so it was makes a mirror so you can't see in. Right. And and all the vehicles had that or the black, the heavy black tint on them. Mm-hmm. And they were brand new big limousines like, you know, uh, not, well, not just limousines, but big automobiles. Right. I don't remember what brand. They were probably Cadillacs or something. They probably had uh, uh, that bulletproof glass in them and all, all that stuff. I, but I don't know that for a fact. But but they stuck out like a sore thumb and every and everybody pointed to them. So anyhow, I just spent my time walking around Vintin, checking and checking out the city. But it was really busy, you know, heavy traffic. And you know, like I said, all them soldiers there and military and, and it was just kind of crazy. So I didn't spend a lot of time there. So after after. Uh, uh, then 10, I headed out for, it was called the provincial capital in the North long per bong. And, uh, okay, be, be, before, before we go on, it might be helpful, uh, if people want to, uh, to bring up, uh, on your computer or your phone or whatever, uh, map of the country Laos. And the reason I say this is because you're going to, you're going to kind of walk us through, you went from here to there, to there, to here. And, to those listening in a place where they can actually pay attention, it can help uh, to follow the map. So I just wanted to let folks know if you want to follow along with us, you can. Uh, b- before we do that, I have one more question about Laos. Uh, now, I know, you know, the politics in Vietnam, you had North Vietnam, South Vietnam, you had Ho Chi Minh in the South and President Tin in the, or in the North was Ho Chi Minh, the South was Tin. Cambodia had Nordam Sihanouk, Thailand had, had the king, the Rama, I think they called him. What was the government like in Laos? I'm not familiar with that. Well, if you wait, that comes up later here. Okay, uh, I, I'm going. I'm going to discuss all of that. Okay, uh, but but it, it's uh, let me go uh, like the 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 story goes here uh, right now. Okay, okay. So 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 you were where were you as you went into Laos? You entered Laos through what country? Uh, Thailand, and you cross the you cross the Mekong River, and right. Uh, down in the in the it it kind of dips down into Thailand it, it, and right across the Mekong is Vin Tien. So it, it. It, there's a like a little tit there that on the on the uh Thailand side it's Nong Kai. Yes. N O N D K H A I. Correct. And then straight up north of that is the capital of Vin Tien. Mm-hmm. I see it. Laos, I Tien. see it. And then, and then, if you'll follow thirteen, this is where. Not, when I leave in ten, I started with a, a French person and a British person. The three of us started out uh, right on the north side of in ten, and the morning that we headed out, two, three, excuse me, three people are coming in: a girl and two guys, mm-hmm. and I know. One of them was American. Maybe two of them were American. I think the girl and the guy were American. Right on the northern, before they reached uh, Vientiane, they were coming down from Long Prabong. Soldiers stopped them on the road, made them kneel down, put the guns to the back of their rifles, to the back of their heads, and then would pull the trigger, and it would just go click. And then they would just laugh and have a good time. Kept them there for a while. 
Now, we meet these people on the north end of N10 as we're leaving. It didn't mean nothing to us. A bunch of dummies. We <laughs> So they we told you this, out. they we told you this, they told you the story and then you just continued on anyway. Yeah, it was before we started hitchhiking. We were just on the north side of the city and, and we that, we stuck out our thumb after they told us that and we started hitchhiking. Wow. And like I said, uh, I, I, <laughs> a bunch of dummies. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, it, it wasn't long and here comes the car along. Well, he's a, a captain in the Laotian army, mm -hmm. and uh, he picks us up. Well, the French guy gets in the front seat because he the the Laotian could speak French. Sure, because of, so because they, of the, uh, the the colonial influence from the past. Correct. So uh, the British guy and myself, we get in the back seat. I mean, we don't head uh, heading up thirteen. Now we don't get just a few miles. Maybe I don't know if it was even ten miles or something like that. Maybe five miles. The road was washed out so bad that you'd have to dodge these big washouts. Well, the bottom of the car started dragging on the ground. Mm -hmm. So he told us, get out. <laughs> <laughs> he, kept the, he kept the French guy in there because they could speak and, and, and carry on. Okay. So now we're out in the jungle by ourselves. I mean, you're in a So I, now, did he, he, did he keep the Frenchman in the car and then he left and left you two? In the middle of the jungle. Yeah, we, we, uh, yes, we, we had, and I'm talking about it's heavy jungle on, uh -huh. on both sides of the road. So we just start walking and uh, we uh, come around this corner and there's a, a little, uh, a little deer. And I, I got it. It's called a, a lesser mouse deer. I couldn't believe it, how small they are if you want to look them up. Uh -huh. uh, a, a mouse deer and it had little horns little spikes about an inch and an inch and a half long it was in the middle of the road and i guess we walked for an hour or two and all of a sudden we heard this vehicle and we didn't know what it was i i said at the time i said boy something's having bad labor pains <laughs> this thing was growling like you wouldn't believe and uh so we we just kept walking and eventually it makes it to us and it's a deuce and a half truck that has uh fully loaded the sideboards are as high as the top of the cab okay and they had loaded it perfect that it was flat the whole top of the 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 truck was flat the back was flat and then it had a, a heavy con canvas tarp over the top of it and it's what it was was going to the american consulate the u.s consulate in long for okay. and they had a they had a school up there it had cement lumber and i don't know what all that was covered in there that you couldn't see and so he stops and uh the guy spoke some english it, well, pretty good, actually. But we couldn't ride in the cab. We had a helper, you know, on the other side with mm -hmm. him. And so we got up on the back of the truck. Okay. And I sat down with my legs over the front of the thing right next to the cab on the driver's side. The English guy got out and sat on the other side, on the on the drive, on the passenger side. So we head out. I mean, you're talking about grinding and growling and, <laughs> and, and ma making it through the mountains and through all these curves and everything. And it took forever. And as we went, soldiers would in camouflage uniforms would come out of the, the jungle and get out. He'd stop and pick them up and get on top of the truck. One, two, three, four. I think we ended up with about eight or ten on top of the truck with us. Now these were Laotian soldiers. Yeah, but I, again, uh, I'll explain that a little di bit different. Okay. I'm a little later here, okay. but yes, they were La Laotian soldiers and they were in uh, camouflage uniform mm -hmm. and had their rifles with them. So anyhow, we're going along and all of a sudden, because like I said, you're, you're in between your, the, the two forests, you know, the, and, it, the tire, one of the driver's side rear tire duels blows out. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it sounded like a bomb. <laughs> the, 
them soldiers dove and hit the deck. And one of them liked to push me right off. I would have went right down alongside the cabin under the dang wheel of the truck. I dug my fingers into that canvas. I mean, I dug so hard, I, I finally held on. But I, I thought I was going. And so the the truck driver, he stops. They all get out and they look. And that's when they see that the tire is blowed out. So he looks around. They, they all... Uh, 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 chambered a shell into their weapons even the driver did with and he had a pistol strapped on his side but he didn't like the situation where he was at because he, you could be attacked real easy there there was no so he kept driving until he got to an s in the road where he could see the road both ways at a distance okay so anyway they finally stopped where he, where he thinks it's safe and they start working on this here tire, taking this tire, the, taking the, the, the tire off and, and getting the tube out and everything. Well, he had a tube there, but it, it, it had a hole in it. Do you remember, do you know what a hot patch was? Yes. Back but, in but the ex- day. Ex- explain it to the people though. Okay. They, they had different brands, but we used to, I used to use them at the store and, and repair tires and they were camel hot patches. And it's what it is. It's a little diamond-shaped metal container with phosphorus inside of it. I mm-hmm. think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And and it has a, a on the bottom of it, the sides are rolled up about a quarter of an inch, which holds this phosphorus in there. On the bottom of the metal is a piece of rubber that when you fire that thing up, it gets very hot. It melts that patch onto the tube of the tire and re and uh repairs the, the the hole right with a chemical reaction right but you have a clamp to to hold to hold that thing down you had to clamp it down to hold it down there real tight well their clamp was busted so the driver and all these are people they had never seen anything like this the, i mean the soldiers had never seen the driver of course knew what it was but because the clamp was broke, him and the his uh, passenger, his helper, had to hold it down with two screwdrivers. They would pry it down and try to hold it real tight with two screwdrivers. Uh-huh. Well, like I said, they were all worried about being attacked there. That's why they drove to that S in the road. So all of a sudden, here they are in a one big circle, these eight or ten soldiers and the guy and his helper in the middle doing this thing and they're watching it fizz they all got their butts up in the air bending over looking at this thing i told the english guy i'm going up there was a big tree up the hill a ways i said i'm putting my back against that tree if somebody would come out of this jungle shooting they, they'd shoot all them people right in the butt yeah they would <laughs> the whole bunch was bent <laughs> over nobody was paying attention to anything but that little hot patch fizzing and uh it, it was actually pretty funny, but but it wasn't at the same time. And then uh, we get they got that all fixed, and got the tire back on, and away we go again. Well, as you come to the clearing, kind of you're you're out of the jungle for a while, and there would be like clearings there. Okay, they you started seeing these wire encampments which I didn't know until later, but is what they, what they were, they, they took the, the CIA used the, it's H-M-O-N-G, the, this name people, they call them Hmong. I the think Hmong, how yes, they, they're, they're the, they, like the, like the, like the forest people. Yes. And they took them out of their little villages or where, as they lived in, I think they farmed and stuff too, you know, rice and stuff. Yes. And, and they took them out of the, where they all lived and they put them in these wire encampments to protect them. And they would fly over with the plane and drop parachute, the rice and stuff, the food into them. This was their families. The men were all out fighting with the, for the CIA. So, huh. so you, you seen, a couple of these encampments along the road. You couldn't tell how big they were because they were they were pretty well hidden, except for one side you'd see the wire. And it was like a, I don't know, like a eight-foot chain-link fence with barbed wire all along the top of it. 
And uh, so that was one of the things that the next thing was they, they well, they called they called them the 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 they. I don't know who, but they say they called them traitors and lackeys of the CIA, mm-hmm. the, the, these uh, among people. And uh, like I said, they parachuted in the supplies and stuff. And then as you would go down the road in these here clearings, there was piles of brass shell casings. I mean, piles like three feet diameter, maybe two foot high or something and also spent fuel tanks of the jets that they would drop after they used the fuel out of them. Uh And then the people would, and I don't know who, because you didn't see anybody doing it, but they were piled up there along the road. And I guess the intent was to sell them for scrap. Yes, or I'm sure, yes, scrap, and use them over again, uh, you know, for uh, uh, making shells, I'm sure. Okay, I guess just reload them then. Right. Okay. And the tank, the tanks, I don't know. They didn't look beat up. They didn't look smashed up. I'm sure they, they, they had dents in them, but I never, you know, went and inspected them because mm-hmm. we were passing by them as, as we did it. And the, the, the brass, I, I didn't really look at them close. I don't know if they were like a 50 caliber or bigger or smaller, but something like that. They were, they, they were in that size. And like I said, just piles and piles of them. And uh, so this 120 miles from Ben Tent along as the crow flies, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how many miles it is in the truck because you're switching back all day long. Right. And when nighttime come, everybody's the road stops. Everybody has to get off the road. It's too dangerous at night. Now, is that because so, they can't see where they're going or because of uh, snipers no, or bandits or what? Right. That is soldiers, uh, you know, uh, the, because of the war. So Got they it. would not drive at night. So okay. anyhow. So you're, you're still you're still on this Highway 13 all the way up from uh, Vientiane to uh, uh, Long Prabang. Yes. Okay. And, and we're, we're, we're in the vicinity where... Uh, the 13 and four, I think it was in that vicinity where we stopped. And there was a little uh, like a coffee tea house along the road. And they had snacks and, and stuff like that there. And that and looks like where, it's near the town of uh, Zhang Wen? Yes. Okay. Uh, X-I-A-N-G-N-G-E-U-N. Okay. It, and I'm not sure it was right there, but it was it was somewhere in that area, which okay. wasn't far from Long Prabang. But it was nighttime, and he they don't drive. No, nobody drives, they say. So anyhow, when you're in uh, uh, Buddhist uh, countries, you can go to a Buddhist temple and and get a place to sleep. Mm-hmm. In the bigger temples, they have buildings on the outside, like a horseshoe. It, it never goes around the back where the altar is, but but on both sides and on the on the front, you know, before you walk into sure. the temple. On the smaller temples, they have outside in the temple area itself, right around the walls, they'll let you sleep. So I asked them uh, where if there was a Buddhist temple there, and they said, "Yeah, right, right down the road." They pointed, and so we took off, and we went to the Buddhist temple. So I asked, the, I go in there and, and I asked the head monk uh, through sign language and everything uh, whether, where, if we could uh, sleep there. And he showed us where, where we could sleep. So we get out our sleeping bags and roll everything out. And we were tired because, it, I mean, even though it was on top of a truck we, and we did walk some, but uh, it was, a, it was a, a long day. And uh, he showed us and we just no more and got laid down and in come these two soldiers all in camouflage with mm-hmm. their rifle. Mm-hmm. They take off their boots because you're not supposed to enter a temple with right. shoes on. They took off their boots. They took off their hats and they stood their rifles by the door. So they were going to they, sleep there as well. No, they said, come. They wanted us to go with them. Okay. And, and the British guy was going to get up and, and, and go. I says, no. 
I says, I'm not going nowhere with them. I don't care who they are. Uh, I, it, it doesn't matter. I'm not going with them. And so he, uh, he, he, he was really worried, but I, I was hard headed. I've always been hard headed. And, uh, they kept saying, come, that's the only English word they knew. And, uh, they would pull on you, you know, grab your arm and try to pull you and stuff like that. And I just told, I told them, is what I do. I'd look them right in the eye. And I said, the only way you're taking me out of here is if you shoot me and carry me out or you pick me up and carry me out one or the other. That, that's the only way I'm leaving. And I meant it. I, I, there was no way I was going with these people. Well, after about a half an hour of trying to get us out of that temple, they leave. They're mad, but they leave. Did, so did you ever thought, figure oh, out why they wanted you to go with them? N never did. Never did. The, uh, I don't know if they thought we were spies or what. Oh, dang it. That's something I forgot to bring up. What's that? It, in Vientiane, when, when we were there just walking around the city, we met other Westerners mm -hmm. that were contacted by, they said, the C and I never was. I just, this is only hearsay. They were contacted by people of the CIA, and they would uh, give you a motorcycle that had a camera built in the headlight, and they wanted you to drive through the country, through through Laos, taking pictures of bridges and buildings and, and stuff like this. And these people told us about that. They were, they were asked to do that. Now, like I said, I don't know how true that was, but that there were people on motorcycles and I'm assuming that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we gets laid down and boy, just about ready to go to sleep. Here comes these two soldiers back in. They don't take off their boots. They don't take off their hats. They don't put down their guns and they start hollering. They want us out of there. And again, I just look him in the eye and tell him, you either shoot me and carry me out or you pick me up and carry me out because I'm not going with you. And after this, this went on for, I don't know, 15 minutes, they go to the head monk because mm -hmm. he come out there because of the ruckus that was going on. Right. And they tell him to, I knew what they, even though I didn't know the language, they were telling him he had to throw us out of there. So he comes to us and tells us we must leave. I told him, no, you told me I could sleep there. That's what I'm doing. I'm sleeping right there. I'm not going anywhere. He didn't know. He got this, you know, he just got this funny look on his face. And, and he didn't know what to do because they were putting pressure on him. Right. And they just, they just kept it up and kept it up. And finally, they were so mad, they just, you know, pulling on us, jerking on us, screaming at us. Uh, you know, they finally just stormed out of there. They just, I mean, they were <laughs> mad and they left. <laughs> and, and, and I still hadn't changed my mind. They were either going to shoot me and carry me out or they were going to pick me up and carry me out. So when they left, the head monk was still there. He he. I guess he didn't know more or less what to do. And uh, right. I went up, you know how they, they uh, uh, prostrate themselves yes. on the floor, on the ground or the floor. Yes. They, 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 they kneel and they lay uh, prone. Then, then you stretch yourself out prone on the, on the ground. Yes. I did that in front of the Buddha, thanking him that maybe my life, he saved my life <laughs> because <laughs> I wasn't sure what, and the, the, the head monk, he, he didn't know what to do. He, he, you could see this look on him. He, he just was very worried and confused as, as what, and especially when I did that, then he really, I don't know. He, he just, uh, he just kind of stared at me, uh, after I got up mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, a afterwards, then I started checking who were these soldiers. So you had the, the royal Lao government, which consisted of three princes, prince, mm -hmm. Heidi, the, the, there was the neutralist, the right wing, and the left wing. And they were called the Lao Patriot, Patriotics. Okay. Patriots. And, and they were fighting against the North Vietnamese 
and the communist Pathic Lao. So these and the, what the people were saying that these two princes, two of them were brothers. The other, the other one was an uncle. But they said sometime they'd be fighting each other. Really? For territory, for riches, for whatever. I don't know. Like I said, I, I can't confirm that, but that's what people would say, that they were uh, that they were fighting each other. But most of the time, they were fighting the Vietnamese and the Pathic Lao. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was telling you, I don't know who the soldiers were. <laughs> they could have been one of the princes. They could have been the Vietnamese. They could have been the Pathic Lao. They could have been anybody. They could have yes. been working for the CIA. You, you, nobody knew. It, it, I had no idea. And nobody, and like I said, nobody knew. So anyway, the, the, the next morning, we get up, wake up wash brush your teeth whatever get out there and we head back to the the little uh stand where the truck driver stopped at did the did the monks feed you no 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 uh uh we didn't eat much food that day at all and the and the next day but but uh we were we we uh w when we got back on the truck it was only i think you know like i think we started out like at seven o'clock in the morning or something like that yes and we were in Long Prabong by nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. And then that's when we ate and everything. Then we didn't worry about it. We, we drank water and stuff, of course, wherever we could get it. But right. uh, I never carried no water. I drank out of streams, rivers, uh, fountains. If there was one, whatever I could get. I have to think you got sick at least once. Yeah. Way, way back in, way back in, uh, uh, 68 in in uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, three three months of dysentery, and then uh, that same year in Kathmandu, I caught hepatitis, and five weeks of that, and after that, I was good to go. I, I the, guess your body had acclimated to all the the bugs in the water, right? Mm -hmm. And never got sick again. And uh -huh. like I said, I drank out of the rivers, the streams whatever uh -huh. wherever there was water i drank it i never carried any any with me and that at that time there was no plastic bottles and right none of none of that stuff so anyway <clears throat> got into long Kabong, and it was a, a beautiful little town little city i don't know, little town it was real peaceful and tranquil and it was right on the mekong the mekong flows all around there all around laos there it does in, in thailand and uh, it just walked around and enjoyed it, enjoyed the peace and, and everything. And, and uh, the, it, it was just nice, just, just relaxed and, 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 and took our time and everything. And uh, the, after, after we had been in uh, uh, Long Prabang for some time, I decided to, uh, go to uh bon Sai, and that's over in the what is the considered the golden triangle it's together with thailand laos and burma all three borders come together right there and what's the name of the town it's bon Sai, b-a-n-h-o-u-a-y-x-a-i Okay, I see. Uh, on the on the on the uh, on Highway Three. On uh, yeah, Highway Three comes down to it. Uh, Ten twenty from Thailand comes up to it. Yes, and uh, it's a it's a real small little town. Well, when we left Long Prabang, we flew out in an old World War DC three. Wow, it had the canvas seats in it. Yeah. Okay. And this thing shook and rattled and rolled down the runway and take off. And then in the air, it just bounced around. And, and I mean, it, it well, was well, now, now, who's now, how did you get onto this plane? I mean, was this a commercial airliner? Did you just hitch a ride with some uh, flying tigers? I mean, what, what, how did you get on this no, plane? It was, it was commercial. Uh, the Laotian uh, government had it uh, or, or the airline, Laotian airline. And uh, they were charging, and, but it was 
I know darn well if it was over two dollars for the flight, I probably wouldn't have paid it. I wouldn't have took it. <laughs> it. It was it was practically nothing, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Were there a lot of other passengers, or was it primarily cargo? No, no, it was, it was passengers. It had the old, uh, like I said, the old canvas seats in it, and they okay. had the two two rows of uh, two rows of canvas seats down each side. I mean, a row down each side. Okay, and there wasn't. I don't know. There wasn't a lot of people on it. And I, I can't even remember if it held 20 people or something like that. Uh-huh. <coughs> so, we're, so, you, so you flew from Bon Win High to where? No, no, from Long for Bong to Bon Win Sai. Okay. I, oh, okay. The, got it. Got it. Okay. On the Google map just shows we Sai. It don't it don't show the B A N. Oh, and and it, now I'm on the the the, the Bing map, and it does say Bon We Sai, but they spell it differently. Yeah, they don't say X A I. They 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 have it. Uh, 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 it's Y X A Y or something like that. Well, it it's three words. It it's not. See, it, it's broke down in three words. It's B A N, and then H O U A Y, and then X A Y or uh, X A I. Sure. And uh, that was a real pretty little town. But here's the thing. When, when you, when you uh, landed there, I just went walking. And I went north of there and west where that little hump is right there. Yes. And, and see where, the, where that uh, yellow line goes up there? Uh, that's the border of on the on where highway four is on the other side or, or uh, the not highway but uh oh boy uh <laughs> i can't even think what i'm trying to say the the so so what the route, route for is that's in burma which uh-huh. is now miramar right okay mm-hmm. and, and below that where the below the mekong there is thailand yes. and of course on on the on we Sai or man we Sai is the laos correct so i walked up around uh, about uh, that hump and up there all, all alongside I, the mekong river basically yes mm-hmm I didn't have to walk very far, and I was standing in poppy fields. Opium and poppies. The, yeah, opium poppies. They're about two and a half inches in in, in uh, uh, diameter, and they're big. And the flowers had already died and 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 uh, fell off. They grow on the top of them, and then they fell off, and then the then the bulb it grows, and that's where they get the. the I happened to just be at the right time when they were harvested. Uh huh. They have all these people, a lot of young women uh, do it. They have like a, what is a parry knife? Yes. A small, you know, parry knife. A tin can, like a soup can. Yes. Well, first of all, let's, let, uh, let me back up. They just have the parry knife and they walk through the field and you ought to see how fast they are. And I think I was in Thailand once when they were harvesting that same time, at that same time, and in Laos. One group would take and cut from the top to the bottom with that parry knife and make slices like orange slices. Okay. 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 They could do it so fast, man. They just, their wrist, and they'd go around that whole bulb and and cut them, just cut them marks in there. Don't, Don't cut deep. And they start oozing this white liquid. Well, as it sits in the sun, it turns black. That's where you get that black opium. Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> but it's white when it, it's pure white when it comes out of there. Well, and, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they had to wear gloves or something, right? Uh, because would, would not the opium seep through their skin and infect them? No, they cut it so fast that by the time when they slice that, they're already moved on when it starts moving out of that oozing out of that slice. Okay. Okay. Now the other ones that did it, where I watched them do it, they would cut right around the in, the circle of the of the poppy seed, right in the middle. They mm-hmm. just make one slice right around the, the the whole thing, and that's all they would do. The others would did it do it in slices. 
I don't know why, but that's what they would do. Then towards the end of the day, not at the end of the day, but uh, in the afternoon then. Mm -hmm. This was done in the morning. In the afternoon, they come along with that same, the same, uh, mainly, like I said, young girls with a paring knife. And it's like a soup can. Mm -hmm. And they would take that knife and go all the way, just flip, start from the bottom and flip up, come around there and clean all the stuff off. Well, then poppy bulbs, they have little hairs on them. Slurries get stuck in them. Bugs get stuck in them. They just scrape all that stuff off and scrape it off along the can, and it eventually slides down into the can. And they just go through these fields as far as you can see as poppy fields. Wow. I mean, amazing. It, it, it's 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 crazy. And uh, anyway, let me get let me look here. Uh, the well, now who who owns these poppy fields? And I assume, okay. it's, I assume it's not illegal there in that country. No, it it, it is, but it ain't. Uh, I guess if you pay the right people, it's not. No, 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 no. The 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 pe the people that that control that whole region. You know who Chiang Kai Shek was. Yeah, he Chiang was. Uh, he was. He fought in the revolution, and he was the one that lost against Mao, and he was forced over to Taiwan. That's correct. His his soldiers control that whole that the, what they they call that the golden triangle: mm -hmm. Burma, Thailand, and Laos. And that's all poppy fields. It's, I mean, there's it's. Uh, let me let me let me get my stuff together here. It's uh, three hundred and sixty-seven thousand acre square miles, not acres. Three thousand six. 3,067, excuse me, start over, 367,000 square miles of poppy fields. Wow. And that's who controls it. And they're they're called the, I, I, I'm terrible at pronouncing stuff. It's K-U-O-M-I-N-T-A-N-G. It sounds like Kalimantong, but it, it, it's, it's Kumo Kumin. Kumantong, I think, is is kind of how you say now, it. Now, is that the name of a people, a company, an organization, a government? What are they? That's his soldiers. That's the, They were the Chiang Kai-shek soldiers. Of course, he's dead. Sure. But they say that's the people who still control that that area, or they did back then. Now, if they do, I don't know who so, does. So in, the, in 1971, Chiang Kai-shek, who by that time was in Taiwan, controlled the poppy trade in the Golden Triangle. Yes. Wow. Yeah, or he, or his soldiers. They they for short they called them KMT. Uh huh. That was the abbreviation of okay. them. KMT. Okay. And, and uh, like I said, they they uh, they controlled that whole area, and uh, like I said, they they the two different groups uh, harvested it different, but it came out to the same thing. And uh, and then, of course, they have to cook it all down and get all them bugs and all that fuzz and, you know, and everything out of that. That's a whole I didn't get to see that process there. I seen it somewhere else in another country, just mm -hmm. a small a small deal. But but I didn't get to see that uh, that that there uh, in the in the Golden Triangle. But it, it, it was amazing. You, you, oh, and another thing they, they did. They used to, in in Thailand and Laos, on the street, these people would have, they called them little love birds. I don't, I don't know what their exact name was. They were real small bird. And they would weave these little baskets about the size of a grapefruit. Yes. And they'd have a little bird in them. Okay. You, you would buy... You would buy a bird from the guy, and it was you, to release it. It was supposed to be your good luck. Okay. So I started asking them, "How can you keep releasing, and how? Where do you get all these birds? Because people are doing this all day long, every day." Yes. How are you? Where are you getting these birds? They say they're hooked on opium. They feed them little bitty pellets of opium, and when they release them, they fly right back to the owner. <laughs> And he puts him back in another basket the next day, and and, and uh, off to town he goes and to and to uh, sell them uh, for good, for releasing them for good luck. Wow! <laughs> they're wow. addicted. 
it, 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 world is is really different. <laughs> it's a it's a different world. Wow. Well, now, now let me ask. I mean, they 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 farm all these opium poppies, uh, and and I guess I mean opium has its true medicinal purposes, but primarily it's used in the illegal drug trade. Do the people in the area have a problem with opium addiction? Because it's all right there. Yes, they do. Uh, and what they, what you make out of it first is the, the opium. And then the next process is morphine. And then the next process is heroin. Mm-hmm. And this is stronger it gets the the every time you process it. Right. When when I got sick in Kabul, I went to the American consulate there, and I went to the American consulates in in Pakistan. A couple, they would give you tincture of morphine or tincture of opium mm-hmm. to try to get to cure up your your uh, dysentery. Well, but sure. it didn't work. I mean, it didn't work. Well, I had that problem one time, and they gave me. I guess that's what you would call it. Uh, it, it was called. Uh, I think the medical name was called paragoric, but it was an opium derivative. And, but you can only take it for 10 days. And I felt fine for 10 days. And then the 11th day when, when you couldn't take it anymore, or there was the risk of addiction, uh, then I just went right back to having problems. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I was shocked that the, that the American consulate along the way would, would give it to you mm-hmm. when you went in there because you were sick. Uh-huh. But, uh, I don't know if they do that anymore. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Uh-huh, but, uh-huh. but anyhow, uh, uh, that was, that was, uh, uh, oh, something else that happened. That, that was mainly all my travels and, and what happened on that, on that, on that trip. Right. Which was, I enjoyed it uh, immensely, except for the, the soldiers trying to pull their thing, whatever it was. But, uh, when back in, it was either in the late 1900s, like 99 or, or in the early 2000, uh, there used to be a woman out of San Francisco. I think, yeah, I think it was San Francisco. It might, might not have been, but it was out of, she was out of California. And she used to write this travel blog in this. It was in our Sunday newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Okay. And I don't remember for sure what year it was, but. I, I think it was in the 2000s. She wrote this article about the new place the travelers, the backpackers had found, Long Prabone. <laughs> Been there, <laughs> so, done that. So I run a copy of my visa from 1971, and I wrote, I, I had a, it had an email address. And so I wrote this email to the paper, to her paper or whatever I don't remember exactly what, what it was and I like I said I put a picture of my uh, 71 Laotian visa and I said not only do we do they backpack it I hitchhiked it and backpacked it in 71 <laughs> I, I liked her I liked her uh, travel uh, uh, news you know that she had every every sure. Sunday did, she ever, con- did in, she ever contact you it was never in the paper again wow I don't know if I had anything to, I sure didn't mean that, Uh you know, and I don't know if that had anything to do with it because I liked her her thing because she, she had good, good articles. It's just that, that she was way off the beat that they had, the the travelers had just found long for bone in this, like I said, in the two thousands. And, uh, and I don't know what happened. Don't it it was, I, I, I felt bad about it that if that if that's what happened i don't know so after you took your trek uh up highway 13 from uh, uh up to long prabong from the capital vientiane uh and then you took the plane down to uh the border there were you done with with laos is that the last time you went yeah that, that after i spent i spent uh, uh i don't know i think it was just a I don't know. I might have spent a day or two in in Banhui Sai. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, in Laos, and then I crossed over into uh, uh, Thailand. Okay, but across the Mekong again and in, into Thailand. Okay, now, now, now you said you enjoyed your time in Laos, except for 
the hassle with the soldiers. Uh, it seems like to me that that was a big part of your time in Laos, the, the hassle with the soldiers. That was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, it was. But I, I forgot something. I missed something. At nighttime, you would hear this funny sound. And it, it made you look up because it, it did sound like aircraft, but it, it, it was it was different. And there would always be three lights in a triangle. Mm -hmm. So I asked the soldiers, I said, what the heck is that? It was the B-52s going to uh, to Hanoi to bomb uh, at night. You could see them. You wow. could barely hear them, but you could see them three lights in that triangle position. And, and that was the B-52s. What base were they flying out of? Udon, Thailand. It was a huge, big air base. I had hitchhiked right past it okay. when I hitchhiked all the way from uh, through Thailand. Okay. And and and, and that was, uh, like I said, it, it was neat to see that, that, that you could actually see them. They were so high up, man. They I don't know what they, I didn't never look what they flew at, what the elevation they flew at. So there was but, the war going on in Laos, but but you didn't actually see the, the physical fighting. That was closer to the Vietnam border, I guess. That's correct. That was the panhandle was where, where a lot of that was going on. Right. And, and, and when you were in Vientiane, that's where the CIA was, but that's where kind of the, the brain trust, the headquarters were, not the physical fighting. Yes. And, and but I don't know what the soldiers were all doing there. I don't I don't uh, I don't know, understand what they what they were all doing there. But maybe uh, that's where the R and R was. Maybe that's where the hospital was. Maybe a lot like uh, uh, Saigon during the Vietnam war, because during the Vietnam war, except at the end, there wasn't a lot of fighting going on in Saigon. Yes. But, but they, like I said, they were all in their uniforms and they were, they were uh, all had their weapons with them. Mm -hmm. And, and usually on R and R, um, I, don't know about everywhere and stuff and the, uh, sometimes they, they didn't have their weapons and stuff they didn't worry about that they were chasing women and and uh, alcohol uh-huh <laughs> so so i i don't i don't know but uh but laos was very interesting and like i say the mekong river it, it's amazing how it flows all the way around it and, and, you know all the way up to the north like, like it, it flowed it flows right through Long Prabom. It does. Yeah. I saw flows, that on the map. It, it flows. It, that's what the, it's right along the, the whole river. You see how it curves and comes back around and then goes right over there towards Ban Hui Sai. Uh -huh. And then it establishes the border between uh, Laos and uh, Thailand. And Burma. Laos and Burma. Right. Burma to the north, the northwest. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, and I I wish I could have went into Burma, but I, I I never did because when I I flew over it twice and and you could only get a 24 hour visa and uh, it just wasn't worth it and it it was cheaper to fly over it than it was to take a ship uh, you know when I said I took uh, trains and buses I also took uh, cargo ships mm -hmm. a lot of times I would hitchhike on cargo ships small and large. Sometimes you had to pay some uh, a little pen, pence, but uh, uh, sometimes you got them for free too. Now, didn't you say that sometimes they would exchange your uh, your your passage for a little bit of work on the ship? Well, no, that was when I when I ran out of money and and left Singapore. When I uh, ran out of money, then I actually got a waiver from the Coast Guard on an American ship and worked my way back to the United States. Got it. Okay. That was how, that's how you got home. That's how I got home. Yeah. Oh. And that, that was in 73 when I, when I left there uh -huh. and that, and that was a, that was a nice ride too. Uh, made, had to had almost as much money uh, when I landed in Newark, New Jersey, as I did when I left the States five years ago. <laughs> uh, unbelievable. Well, Jerome, your, your, your adventures are just, just amazing. Uh, I love when you come on the show to talk about this. Uh, I can honestly say that I doubt that there's anybody listening to this podcast who has ever spent any time in Laos, uh, except perhaps if they were in the military and maybe, or maybe not, they could admit that they were there. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 
same way with Cambodia. They weren't supposed to admit they were in there either. Right. Now, did you ever spend time in Cambodia or did you ever get that? No, close? no, uh, because uh, uh, that was down to the south now, way down to right. the southern tip of Thailand. I was near that area. Now, that's where Sean Flynn disappeared and they never have found his body. Who is that? Er- Errol, Errol Flynn's son. Ah, okay. He disappeared. That's right. And, and, and I met him in Bali, Indonesia. I, we met him and talked to him. He was, he was a nice person. Uh-huh. He was about four years older than I was. And, and that's what he was doing. He was reporting for the time time magazine. That's correct. Uh, he was a, he was a legitimate reporter. He wasn't an adventurer like you. I mean, he had a job reporting and then he just, maybe he stumbled upon the wrong people or, or, or maybe he did go with the soldiers when he was uh, sleeping in the Buddhist temple. No, he, he, he went across the border into Cambodia. Uh, uh, I think from Laos into Cambodia mm-hmm. down there in the Southern part, you know, where Vietnam and them run along the panhandle right. and they, they seen him cross the border and they, and they, uh, uh, that was the last time anybody seen him yeah. and they never, they found some of his clothes and his pack and stuff or some of the stuff he was carrying, but, uh, he, he was never found. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a lot more dangerous down there and to the East. I went to the North and the West. So, so, uh, uh, it, it wasn't, but at the time I wasn't even thinking about that. I, I, I just, if I could go, I wanted to go to Vietnam, but it was, I, you know, it was just too dangerous right. to, to, and you couldn't get hitchhiked around anyhow. Right. So that's, that's why I didn't go. Well, and I know, I know you've said this on other on other podcasts and th- there are those who don't believe you. I'm not one of those. Uh, but they say, well, I, I don't believe this story. What do you mean? He did this. He did that. Surely he's exaggerating. He said he wasn't afraid. Surely he was. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm naive, but I, I believe every word because I, I don't think a person could make this stuff up. Well, I, I, like I said, I've been told by more than one person that I was a damn liar and there was no way I could do this stuff, you know, <laughs> but that's well, okay. And looking and looking back at it again, and you've told me this more than once that you look back on the things that you did and you shake your head thinking, what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> could have been in trouble a few times. You could have been in trouble more than a few times. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I think that that your sense of adventure uh, and the fact that maybe you didn't show fear had a lot to do with the fact that, uh, that you walked away virtually unscathed from all these uh, uh, adventures, whereas it it could have very easily turned out uh, not too great. I think what, I think what helped me, I've always been strong headed and I, I did, yoga i got into it heavier after that even but mm-hmm. I, I think that's what kind of kept my mind where i could think straight and and uh didn't let things uh uh upset me where you know if you show fear to them people i'm sure they would have drug us out of that temple yeah yeah and, and like i said the british guy he got scared as hell he went right away to putting on his clothes and he was going to leave and i told him i said oh hey i'm not going you know that's up to you what you want to do, but I'm not going. No, no way. So the so the Brit stayed too then. Yeah, and he stayed because he knew I was dead serious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Now let me ask you, 1971. That was 52 years ago. Have you ever had any inclination of going back? I I don't think I'd go there. There's other places I want to go. Uh, man, I I. India, I would love to go back there. That that's uh, that's that's one place I miss. So many beautiful places in India. Well, you, and, you still have friends in India, correct? That you correspond yeah, know, with. That you correspond know, with. Yeah, but uh, I don't know that I ever will. And like I say, I, I want to go to Peru, but and do the Inca Trail. But I don't know if my knees will uh, keep do it. If they'll work on work for me. Can you can you do the Inca Trail uh, in the seat of a Toyota Four Runner? Well, I guess some of it. I, I not guess not, the, not the same thing, I guess. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I still, you know, even when I, 2013, when I didn't, I don't want to take taxes. To, in fact, just the other day on one of them uh, uh, websites of India, one of the guys had put a thing on there uh, uh, about taking taxi. Tell me your worst experience taking a taxi. <clears throat> and I told him he never took one. He says, well, how did you get around? <laughs> and I told him a lot of walking, uh, you know, and trained uh, lo uh, steam locomotives and buses and stuff. And, and uh, he, he invited me back to, to India, said he'd be glad to show me around if, he, if I come back to India. Uh -huh. I'm, sh I'm sure it's changed dramatically. I mean, oh. India, India is still a poor country, but they've, they're so industrialized. They've, they've modernized. They have a, a true middle class there now. I mean, it's just, uh, they've, they've made such progress in that country. Everywhere. Na Nepal, they show the pictures of around Kathmandu. That was all farmland. When I was there, there's no farmland. It's all buildings, <laughs> homes, and I mean, there's no, it, it was all rice paddies, and uh, there's nothing there. Bali, Indonesia, it's, you know, I mean, it's like another world. Uh, uh, Bora Bora, Tahiti, I mean, it was, there was nothing there. Uh, it was just a, a nature, you know, and, and now it's all for them rich people, you know, to go there and have spend their weddings or holidays and stuff and live in them them little huts right on the water with glass floors. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> everything has changed. I mean, so much back then. It was hardly the playground of the rich when you were there. Not at all. Like I said, you had to, you had to buy your French bread. That was the only bread there was. If you wanted to bread to make a sandwich, you had to buy it at seven o'clock in the morning or you didn't get no bread. <laughs> that, that was, you know, and, and the, the stores just had very little. And w when I wrecked my Vespa motor scooter, uh, they took me to a what they called the hospital. Yeah, didn't even have electricity. The nurse had to hold the kerosene lantern while the doctor stitched up my nose, the bridge <laughs> of my nose. <laughs> well, well, Jerome, you've had you've had unbelievable experiences. Uh, I know when we talked, we've been trying to put this together for a little while, but our schedules just didn't cooperate. And then when you told me, you know what, my wife says I need to talk about Laos, and that's what we chose. And I'm certainly glad we did. Okay. Well, well, I hope it turned out okay. I, it, it, cer it certainly has. And uh, if you're if you're up for it, I'd love to do it again. P yeah. Pick out another <laughs> interesting part of the world, and we'll do that the next time. How's that sound? Okay. Very good. Hey, thanks a lot, Jerome. I appreciate the time. All right. You're welcome. Thank. Th take care. Well, that's it. We're done. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address. Send me your email address. I will go ahead and uh, take your, your email address, put it in the data bank. I will send you a link to the podcast. Uh, you can download it after it's published and uh, listen to it at your leisure. Well, that's it. I'm done. Until next time, this is James Strong saying adios.